say we could have time for Q&A. We'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. We'll do a Mangala Charan. Definitely need a long Mangala Charan today because the topics that we are covering are very esoteric, very beautiful, very ineffable, um, otherworldly. And so in case you don't know, um, sometimes I go on and on for a Mangala Charan and I'm just like, I don't know if anyone else is like doing this or not. But I really, really um, request of you to do the Mangalatron with me today. I'll share my screen and put the prayers in case you don't know them, because it's a really important thing to set our mind and set our hearts um, in the right place and in the right space, especially when we're discussing these deeper uh, topics of Ras Lila. Yes, so I'll share my screen for the Mangalatron. I have a little drone. I don't know if anyone can hear it, but it helps me meditate. So we'll chant together. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Pandeham Shri Gurun Shri Utapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupa Sagrajata Sahagana Raguna Tamvitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanvitam Scham He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopeka Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patita nam pavane bio Vaishnave bio namo namaha Nama om Vishnu padaya Krishna prestaya bhutale Srimate bhakti vedanta Swamini tinamine Namaste saraswate deve Gauravani pracharine Nirvishesha shunyavadi Aschatya deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Sorry. Right. Prabhu, we have our friend Marie Teresa here. She's never been to a Bhagavatam class before. I know that's quite a challenge to uh, yeah. explain the 10th the canto to somebody like that, but I'm sure Krishna will help you. I will try my best because today I am getting a little deep today. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, I will try my best to make it as 
open as possible while at the same time getting deep. But we are we're going some places today because the nature of the verses that we're talking about today is a specific doubt in our tatva, essentially. Um, so anyway, I ask my blessings, please. I need them from all senior senior disciples, Prabhupada disciples. Um, Adipurush Prabhu, Arjuna Prabhu, I don't know if you're there listening, but if you are, please give me your blessings. And um, everyone else here, all the Vaishnavas, assembled Vaishnavas. So let us um, let us read the verse. Let's get right into it because we have a small amount of time. I hope that Mangala Um, My plan, by the way, folks, is um, I'm really happy to start Mondays uh, like this with all of you. And so I'm planning uh, to do every Monday Bhagavatam class with all of you. Um, I hope, please pray that I can, I can do that. <laughs> That's the plan. Um, with, of course, the exceptions when I'm in India and such. So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, Canto 10, chapter 33, verses 26 to 27, and then also verse 28. Yeah, so in context, we heard uh, the description of the Ras Lila. And now there's kind of the end of that description and uh, Parikshit Maharaj is speaking. So I'll read the Sanskrit, the translation, the purport as such. So it says, Shri Parikshit Uvacha Sangstapanaya Dharmasya Prashameya Tarasya Cha Avartino Hi Bhagavan Angshena Jagadishwara Sakatam dharma se tunam bhakta karta bhirakshita pratipa macharad brahman paradhara bhimarshanam. Translation Parikshit Maharaj said, O Brahmana, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord of the universe has descended to this earth along with his plenary portion to destroy irreligion and reestablish religious principles. Indeed, he is the original speaker, follower, and guardian of moral laws. How then could he have violated them by touching other men's wives? The purport by the disciples of His Holiness Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Kijai. As Shukadeva Goswami was speaking, King Parikshit noticed that some persons seated in the assembly on the bank of the Ganges were harboring doubt about the Lord's activities. These doubtful persons were karmis, jnanis, and others who were not devotees of the Lord. To clear up their doubts, King Parikshit asks this question on their behalf. Verse 28. Translation, O oh, faithful upholder of vows, Please destroy our doubt by explaining to us what purpose the self-satisfied Lord of the Yadus had in mind when he behaved so contemptibly. The purport, it is clear to the enlightened that these doubts will arise in the minds and hearts of persons unfamiliar with the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Therefore, since time immemorial, great sages and enlightened kings like Parikshit Maharaj have openly raised these questions to provide authoritative answer for all posterity. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Okay. So, there's a doubt. There are doubts. <laughs> um, also, I'll be referencing a lot of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary, which is a lot more um, in-depth than the commentary by the disciples of Srila Prabhupada. Um, I won't read it because I don't think we have time for those purports, but I'll be referencing and basically building off of that. But the first point I kind of want to start off with is that um, we have to take this in context, right? So the Ras Lila is being, the description of the Ras Lila is being spoken by um, Shukadeva Goswami to Parikshit Maharaj. He has a few days left to live and he's on the banks of the Ganges and an assembly of people have of different saints and you know spiritual seekers have assembled along the banks of the Ganges to hear this. And so what we're being told here is that some of those in that assembly were not devotees. Some of them were karmis and some of them were jnanis. 
And those were the ones that were having the doubts specifically. Um, and so in general doubt, I think uh, there's a place for doubt. Um, I don't think that we should just follow blindly. Srila Prabhupada never wanted anyone to follow blindly. And therefore there is a place for doubt. Arjuna has a doubt at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. And um, the doubt is meant to, in many ways, serve as a servant to our potential, right? Because if I am not asking questions um, that are going to up-level me in my understanding of bhakti or up-level me in whatever aspect of life, but obviously this is from a Bhagavatam class, so in our understanding of bhakti and in our practices of bhakti, then that means that I'm just staying in the same place. Um, and I'm not actually getting deeper and deeper into the lila, into the understandings, into the tattva. And I think that this particular topic that we're talking about today is really important because, of course, there is, um, you know, there's a simplicity to Krishna consciousness. Oh, you know, just love Krishna and everything will follow. And that's absolutely 100% true. However, our lineage of um, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, yes. Madhva, Brahma, Gaudiya, Vaishnavism, it has been under attack for centuries since its inception, and many people had doubts. And I think an important thing to remember is that we don't necessarily need to do the work of proving or disproving anything, because the previous acharyas have already done this for us. And actually, it is only our, our, our service and our job to, to know that and to know what it is that has been discussed to know what it is that the doubts have been, because when we're amongst devotees, there's no doubts. Krishna's in our heart. We love Krishna. There's no doubts about Raslila or anything. We accept that this is an ineffable, spiritual, can't be compared to any type of material, lusty thing. And so there's no doubt. However, especially, and this is bringing it more into the practical realm. However, when we are, um, approached by new people, when we are approached by spiritual seekers who might not necessarily have um, these esoteric understandings, why would they? Um, and they ask, they ask questions like this. And these questions are quite common, right? From people who are gyanis or karmis or et cetera. I have a lot of experience in this because I'm in the yoga world. And in the yoga world, everyone is reading some other translation of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, they're reading, they're reading some Mayavadi translation like this. And so many times I'm asked, well, why is it like this? And oh, this is just a metaphor, right? And why did Krishna do this? And why like this? So in our in the mood of preaching, we should be pre prepared to answer these questions, actually. It, and that that requires from us our own, what's the word? Um, our own investigation into what have our previous acharyas said. And so, yes, doubt can be a good thing because it pushes us to um kind of like to a test, to test our boundaries, to test our faith, right? To really test um, if we really love Krishna or not, yes? If we really, if we really, really, really believe this Shastra or not, and we take this as Krishna is speaking to us, yes? And, you know, Bhagavad Gita is such a beautiful example. I won't go so much into Bhagavad Gita today because um, I do want to leave some time at the end, and I tend to not do that. Um, and I'm going to try my best. But Bhagavad Gita is a perfect example. At the beginning, Arjuna says, you know, what is this famous verse? Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava, right? Like my heart is just completely um, weakness. I have weakness of heart. I don't know what to do anymore, right? I've lost all composure. I no longer know what is Shreya, what is the ultimate good. So I'm surrendering unto you, Krishna, as your disciple, please instruct me, right? Because he has all of these doubts. He doesn't know what to do anymore. And fast forward to the end of the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna, you have dispelled my doubts. Yes, I no longer have these doubts. You have dispelled the illusion. And something really beautiful. I won't get into this too much because I could, I could get into this a lot. But uh, in the purport to that verse where Arjuna is, I can't remember the verse number. It's like 70 or something like this. It's, it's right after that 
Sarva Dharma Paritya Jat. It's like a few verses after that when Arjuna starts speaking. And in the purport, I was reading this yesterday, and Srila Prabhupada says something so beautiful that we all know, but it's a really good reminder, which is he says in the purport, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not reading, that um that the nature of the of the soul is to serve. That we are our nature is the nature of the jiva is to be a servitor. And if we are not serving Krishna, we will serve Maya. Yeah, or serve illusion for those newer in the class, serve material things, right? If I'm not serving a higher um, reality, then that means I'm serving this mundane reality. And that means I am looking for happiness and satisfaction in dead matter, which cannot give me happiness and satisfaction. Yeah, I can't have a loving relationship with this table that my computer is sitting on, right? It's just not going to work. I can't have a loving relationship. And I think a really good example, I cannot, sometimes we need to hear this, I cannot have a loving relationship with my phone, right? Even though that's what seems to be happening a lot nowadays, right? Is we're so absorbed, you know, I'm really worried about the younger generation, but we're not going to get into that because like I'm the generation that still grew up with, with the memories of not having a phone. I was just joking around with a friend yesterday about like dial up um internet and how bad it was <laughs> but anyway so we can't have a loving relationship with dead matter and so Srila Prabhupada says really clearly in this purport that if we're not serving Krishna if we're not if we're not directing our attention to Krishna then we are inevitably going to serve Maya and we're going to look for that satisfaction in in, in matter and that's going to make the doubts even worse. Yes. So, okay, that was my little spiel on doubt. But now let's really get into these verses and what's getting what's what's being discussed here. So, first of all, I'd like to say that this topic is very high. Um, I was a little worried about talking about this because I was I was really praying. I was like, I don't, I don't you know, I I really want to get into these verses, um, and I didn't know how it was going to manifest. I was just praying. Radha Mulidar. And it was so sweet, actually. I'll give one little thing. Yesterday, we had a Pujari Sangha at the Bhakti Center. It was a Sangha for all of those that do Pujari Seva on the altar. And um, the whole sharing circle was about reciprocation, our experiences of reciprocation with Radha Mulidar, with the deity. And it was just so beautiful to hear the different stories of um, reciprocation. And the reason I'm saying this is because I had quite an intense reciprocation for this class. I was really praying. I was like, I really don't know what to do for this class. I just, I don't know. And then I get a call from my very dear friend, Jai Jagana, And he says, I'm flying into New York today. I need to stay at your place for one day before I go to Columbia. And I said, yeah, okay. Cause he stays here when he's in New York. And so he comes and that was my reciprocation. I was like, Jai Jagana, help me. I need to know what to do for this class. And he gave me some topics. And then Radha Mulidar is even more reciprocation than that was these topics that he was giving me. I was, I was like, okay, these are quite complex, but I'll try my best. And then this morning I was feeling a call. I woke up quite early. My body just woke me up very early. And I was, what do I do? You know, I finished chanting. I did my morning program. Like, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, I don't want to be absorbed by dead matter. So I've been feeling a call to read this book. And it is the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And I read the introduction. And again, I felt Radha Mulidar's reciprocation because the introduction was specifically about these topics, like, like literally specifically the same verses, the same topic that I will be discussing right now. And I was just like, wow, like that's that's some reciprocation, you know. Okay, so let's get into it. So it, there are basically two points being made here um, in the purports of, of, of both the Bhaktivedanta purports and Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti uh, Thakur's purports, that there is a doubt about Shukadeva Goswami, because Shukadeva Goswami has such a high realization, and everyone knows that. The, the, the karmis know it, the jnanis know it. Everyone knows that Shukadev Goswami is an enlightened being. So there is a doubt by these karmis and jnanis. Why is someone with this high level of realization so preoccupied with these romantic affairs of Krishna and the gopis? And not only romantic affairs, but seemingly 
illicit paramour, you know, kind of like, why? And the thing is that I think from an objective point of view, not from a devotee point of view, that makes sense why they would have a doubt, right? Like, why is someone who is so enlightened, like engrossed in this, these pastimes of these girls and Vrindavan and Krishna doing all these, you know, all these things. So that's doubt number one. Yeah, because essentially um, the story seems adharmic, right? Adharmic meaning dharma, um, righteousness, and adharmic against that. Yeah. So the story or the verses, uh, the description of Rasa seems adharmic to these karmis and gyanis. So there's they they have a doubt about Shukadev Goswami. And then the second doubt, um, and this is directly coming from Srila Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur's purport because he mentions let's see I think this is the purport to yeah this is the purport to the second verse the verse 28 he says um Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is talking as if he was King Parikshit like he's giving this dialogue his purports are quite interesting like that so it says Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur King Parikshit continues his inquiry right, as of King Pariksha is speaking. If you argue that the Supreme Lord, that for the Supreme Lord, there is no adharma, e-religion, then why would he perform such abominable acts? One cannot answer that he does so to fulfill his desires because his desires are already fulfilled, aptakama. And this is really an interesting, uh, he goes on to say, Sri Krishna is Aptakama and Atmarama. Yes, we've heard of Atmaram, which means self Krishna is self satisfied. There's absolutely nothing that Krishna needs, right? Krishna doesn't need our, you know, Pujari Seva, or he doesn't need us to offer the ghee lamp or whatever. This is his mercy for us to engage in loving devotional service with him. But Krishna, ontologically is atmaram self satisfied and then this other term is coming up atmakama which means ones whose desires are always met so what's being discussed here in the purport by Srila Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur is that one cannot argue that Krishna is doing this raslila with the gopis because he wants to have his desires met because Krishna is atmakama, uh, aptakama. His desires are always fulfilled. So this is the doubt number two. Yeah, the doubt number two is there, need, there seems to be a need for reconciliation of Krishna's ontological nature, right? His, his own nature, because it's saying his own nature is always self-satisfied and all of his desires are always met. So if he's always self-satisfied, why did he need to do Raslila? If it's all of his desires are always met, then why did he need to do Raslila? So again, this makes sense why these karmis and gyanis would have their doubts and want to fight and want to, you know, all this, not them specifically, but some of these other things I'm going to get into. Um, but the real, the reality is that karmis and gyanis they are missing a very potent, um, extremely important uh, ingredient to the recipe of understanding bhakti. Because even a neophyte devotee might not necessarily understand the esoteric implications and all this stuff of Ras Lila and Ras Tattva and Parakya Bhav, which we're going to get into and I'm going to explain all those things. Um, but they can accept that yeah, it's Krishna, you know, like I love Krishna, I have faith in Krishna. So whatever he's doing is correct. You know, even someone who has that shraddha, that faith, they can accept they might not understand the intricacies, but they understand that it's not against any sort of dharma or anything like this. So karmis and jnanis are missing that ingredient. And that ingredient is shraddha, is faith. And uh, faith is not something that can be manufactured. Faith is not something that can be logically understood. Um, faith, according to Srila Bhakti, uh, Srila Rupa Goswami, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, faith is given by association with devotees, with pure devotees. And so I'm sure we've all had those moments that are inexplicable, ineffable. We can't put them into words where we meet 
maybe our guru or a devotee, a pure devotee, we can't put it into words. And it's just like, it's all emotion. It's all heart. It's just like, oh, wow, wow, you know? And you're receiving almost like this beyond language type of reciprocation, right? I'm sure we've all experienced that from, from someone. I hope, I hope you have. And if you haven't, then you should go seek out some sadhu and hear from him, yes? Um, so where was I going with this? Oh yeah, shraddha. So karmis and gyanis, no shraddha. And therefore they will have doubts. And again, to try to make this a little bit <laughs> for newer people, even though this is a really intense topic for newer people, um, people who come to the bhakti center, people who, uh, something I really love about the bhakti center. I love it so much. It's one of my favorite Favorite things about it. Well, that's not true. Radha Muli Daris Gorchandra. Okay. One of my favorite things about the Bhakti Center is the mood of the Bhakti Center is never ever to impose, to, to really proselytize, to really like bang people over the head with philosophy and rules and this and et cetera. And Radhanath Swami's and all of, you know, I remember even when I first came to the Bhakti Center, the mood that I encountered was, we're going to meet you where you're at. We're going to meet you where you're at. And therefore, shraddha is something, faith is something that develops over time. It develops with that connection with a devotee. I can't just go to someone and be like, we're going to talk about all these esoteric topics and all of a sudden you're going to have faith. No, right? And so, and also that that small faith that might be there in, a, in another devotee, in that sadhu sangha, the blossoming of that flower, there's no, that blossoming of the, of the lotus of the heart that we talked about. I, I think I talked about this last class, Kaidava, right? There's no timeline. It's not like I have, to, you know, we have to, oh, you're not becoming a devotee fast enough, or you're not having faith fast enough, or like this. There's, there's no timeline. And that's something that's really beautiful about the Bhakti Center, that if you want to dive deeper, and if you're feeling genuine, um, attraction to these deeper topics, then all these programs are here for you. You know, Bhagavad Shravana, these morning Bhagavatam classes. And if you and if you don't have that, that's also okay. That doesn't make you like bad or less than, you know, which sometimes can happen in devotee sanghas. Oh, you don't know that? Oh, you don't know that verse? Mm -hmm. You know, like devotees do that kind of stuff. But the Bhakti Center is very like, oh, you just want to come to Kirtan and go to yoga classes? Jai Ho, Hare Krishna, you know? And that's beautiful in and of itself. However, we're here in Srimad Bhagavatam class. So we're talking um, a little bit more about, and I'm going to give myself six more minutes to finish this. I hope I can do it. Um, we're here in Bhagavatam class, so we're, we're getting a little bit deeper. Okay, so back to the doubt. So those are the main two points. There seems to be a reconciliation necessary for Shukadeva Goswami. And there also seems to be a reconciliation necessary for Krishna's ontological position as um, Atma Ram and Aptakam, right? It's always self-satisfied and his desires are always met. I'm not going to speak on the answer. I'm just letting you all know that now because those are the next few verses and I don't want to jump ahead. But what I will speak on is this is a doubt that has been going around for a very long time. In the times of the Goswamis, these doubts were there. Yes. And the doubts continue till today. And like I said at the beginning, to reiterate, we don't need to do any of this work because the Goswamis already have, and the Acharyas already have, and there's, it's already laid out for us. So I'll basically give a little bit. Um, this, is, this is part of my conversation with, uh, with Jai, and then I'll get to that, that introduction of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu. But apparently, um, and my understanding of this is not the most. I'm just putting that out there, but it's it's really interesting. Apparently, um, there is a book uh, called the Ujvala Nilamani, which I have not read. It's on my, I have it, but I have not read it because I'm still reading uh, this, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu And it is the kind of the, the next book uh, after Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, right? After Nectar of Devotion. And I'm not going to get into any super intense esoteric, et cetera, but there's a point here that is valid and important for us to understand for the purpose of these verses and for the purpose of this class, which is apparently, 
I don't know the full history of this. Some of Jiva Goswami, Jiva Goswami wrote, wrote the commentary to this. So Rupa Goswami wrote the Ujvala Nilamani and Jiva Goswami wrote the commentary. And apparently he, he had some followers, some of his followers um, were quite neophyte, it seems, and they were creating some problem, it seems. And they were really, really not okay with the fact that the Padakia Ras, I'll explain what that means, the paramour relationship between Krishna and the gopis, right? So that means unwedded. They're not married. Unwedded relationship, paramour. Um, so these followers of Jiva Goswami were apparently ups quite upset. It was quite like a political thing, apparently, about that our lineage was um, uh, glorifying this as the topmost. And they believed that the Swakya Ras, or the wedded Ras, so you can think of Krishna's Rasa with Queen Rukmini, right? The wedded Ras uh, was more um, high, yeah? So there was this whole tension, apparently. And there's apparently this famous verse in the Ujvala Nilamani, which we're not going to read, which um, it seems it's in the first part, verse 21, but it seems that um, Srila Rupa Goswami is speaking about the criticism. He's, he's, he's criticizing or speaking badly about paramour relationships in the material world, right? So that means um, relationships out of marriage, right? So he's speaking not so great about that. And Rupa Goswami clearly states that the criticism of material of the material paramour by the author, by himself, does not apply to Krishna. Boom, full stop, right? Doesn't apply to Krishna. Who appeared in this world to taste the thick Madhura Ras as Upapati. Upapati means the paramour, right? Now, apparently, Srila Jiva Goswami, in his commentary, seemingly wrote and argued that this wedded Swakya Ras was better than the Parakya Ras or higher. But the last sentence of his commentary is super interesting. He says, some of this has been written by my own will and some by the will of others. What is consistent is my opinion and what is not consistent is the opinion of others. And so then Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur writes a commentary on that commentary, like 20 pages, basically like picking it apart. And it's very interesting. But what I'm taking from this, you know, we can we can forget about whatever political things were happening with his followers, who this, whatever, et cetera. But what I'm taking from this is, is time and circumstance. Yeah, time and circumstance. That means that um, Srila Prabhupada, when he came to the West, he saw that, you know, these crazy hippies uh, they weren't going to be able to chant 64 rounds. So he said, okay, you chant 16. Yes. He shifted so many things for time, place, and circumstance. And so I think there's an argument to be had whether it should be shifted or not, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. Like I said, I don't know this, the historicity of this per se, but I do know that there was apparently a very big conflict with Jiva Goswami's followers. And that's why he wrote this. But he kind of hiddenly put in this disclaimer. The things that aren't consistent here, that's not me. That's, that's for someone else, right? And so going back to the original verse, the karmis and the jnanis who are in the assembly hearing from Shukadev Goswami who have these doubts, you know, we can think about it in our own practical life, in our own practical life, in our own preaching life. We're not going to go to people who, you know, people, I don't, people, some people I self-identify as karmi and jnanis, but like most people that we're meeting in New York City near the Bhakti Center who are new, they're not like, I am a karmi, I'm a jnani. So we can take it from a practical point of view that they might fall into those camps, right? They might fall into those camps. And our approach to them is not going to be, 
Madhurya Ras is the highest Ras and Parakya Ras is the highest Ras. And if you think otherwise, then you're just a fool and a rascal. The end, right? No, we have to think of novel ways of bringing them into bhakti or sharing bhakti with them from a non-sectarian point of view and with love, love amongst all, you know, and really practice this principle of time, place, and circumstance. If we're going deeper in a Srimad Bhagavatam class like this, then yes, we can get into all these details and it's super exciting. And, you know, I mean, I geek out about this kind of stuff. Um, but from our preaching, preaching perspective, we do have to think about that time, place, and circumstance. Okay, I'm going to finish in two minutes. I'm going to read this portion of just, just because I really want to like... Um, get into the whole reciprocation thing. I, I really thought it was crazy this morning that I felt called to this book and then it was literally the same verse, like the same discussion on this verse. Um, so actually there's two parts in the introduction where it speaks about it. So I'm not gonna read the part where it mentions the verse, but just trust me that it does, it's, like, it's right there. I wanna read this part that's a little bit less philosophical and a little bit more like, uh what's the word I'm looking for a little bit more like narrative and nice so I'll just read it and it should take two minutes and then we can open for questions so uh this is this is an introduction written by Narayan Maharaj so he says when Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur was very old he spent most of the time in a semi-conscious state deeply absorbed in bhajan at that time in the state of Jaipur a debate broke out between the Gaudiya Vaishnavas and other Vaishnavas who supported the doctrine of Swakya Vada, right? We're talking about these terms. Swakya Vada means marital love. So the highest love being marital love. Jaya Singh II was the king of Jaipur. The Vaishnavas of the antagonistic camp led Jaya Singh to believe that the worship of Sri Mati Radhika along with Sri Govinda Dev was not supported by Shastra, right? So this is why this stuff is important. You know, we're, okay, I'm throwing out these technical terms and et cetera, but basically if, if we're accepting that Swakya Ras is higher than Parakya Ras, then that means, that's why this is so like intense. Then that means that worship of Srimati Radharani is illegitimate according to these, you know, people in the antagonistic camp. So for us, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we're like, uh, absolutely not, right? No. And thankfully we have the Acharyas to the rescue. Their contention was that Srimati Radhika's name, and this was a question from last class that I taught, that Srimati Radhika's name was not mentioned anywhere in Srimad Bhagavatam or the Vishnu Purana, and that she was never legally married to Krishna according to Vedic rituals. Another objection was that Gaudiya Vaishnavas did not belong to a recognized line of disciplic succession, Sampradaya. There are but four lines of Vaishnava disciple, Vaishnava disciplic succession, which have descended from time immemorial: the Sri Sampradaya, Brahma Sampradaya, Rudra Sampradaya, and Sanaka Sampradaya. Um, so I'm not going to read on because I think really the point was about how this ties into the worship of Srimati Radharani. And later, basically, what's being spoken is that. Um, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur sends his student, Srila Balade Vidyabhushan, to go and actually have a debate with these contenders. And he basically like destroys them. And he proves that our Sampradaya is legitimate under that line of Brahma. And he proves that the Parakya Ras, or the, the, the loving relationship between Krishna and Srimati Radharani and the gopis, that, that Ras um, is the highest. And so it goes on and on. So if you're interested, you can read. And I guess my closing statement here will be that just a reminder that doubt is important. Doubt will lead us to ask more important questions that we will get deeper answers to that will then deepen our realizations and our bhakti. And also it's important to know the history of the debates that our acharyas had with other contenders. It's really important to know that stuff because when we're dealing with it on a 21st century level, um, then we're not just speculating. And we're actually, even though we might not be speaking, oh, this verse and this person said that person, et cetera, we should know what happened and we should know the mood 
um, in which they approach these debates. Because then when we're being encountered with questions by newer people or people that fall into that karmi gyani camp, we can approach them really, really grounded and situated in um, the history of our acharyas. So that is where I will stop. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. And we have four minutes. Sorry, I did the best I could. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. And we had a request from Bhima Prabhu that if it would be possible for you to just stay like maybe five minutes after Darshan, just so that we have time uh, for questions. If, let me if check it's possible. If not, uh, I understand because I also have to go to work, so I can't stay too oh. much later as well. Um, I have a class. You have a class. Yeah. Okay. So let's just try to get in and with this. So Bhima Prabhu, do you have any questions? And since you were the one to request time afterwards, or does anybody else have any questions or comments? Rupesh Prabhu, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing that little about uh, Maharaj and Narayan Maharajas. This chapter was it, Prabhuji, Naika Swabhav? Where you were reading that? Book? This is the introduction. The introduction to this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu Bindu. Uh, that is, uh, Maharaja has that Ujwala Nilamani Kirana, right? You are reading from yes. that Kirana? I'm also reading from this, yes. Yeah, which chapter were you referring to that was? This is chapter 1, verse 21. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I'm sorry, Bhima Prabhu. <laughs> Jeffrey Ackler, oh. yes, please go. Hare Krishna. Um, thank you for this class, Kishore. Uh, I, I was thinking while you were speaking about doubt um, that it's it's very interesting that Krishna exists outside of time and ultimately that we are part and parcel of that and we are eternal. And thus, at some point in reality, we are liberated. At some point, before the end of existence, we are liberated from this material world. And so our bhakti is eternal. And if our doubt is material, then our doubt is temporary. Mm. So in the grand scheme of things, life after life after life, eventually there is a time in reality where we are liberated, but there is also a time in reality where we are removed of doubt. Mm. And so if we zoom out and take the long view of things, eventually, we will be liberated from doubt. And yeah. so if we hold that hope in our heart and and have that prayer in our uh, relationship with Krishna, then the, the, the logical conclusion is that one day we'll be liberated. Right? Yes, I'll just speak one minute on that because we have one minute. I think it's a really important point that you make about like the objective kind of like long term view of the journey of the soul. But I'll speak to something I spoke about last class and I spoke about at the beginning of this class. Srila Prabhupada is really clearly stating that we are serving someone and we're either serving Krishna or Maya. And so I think it's really important to take a personal look at ourselves. Last time I spoke about how the heart becomes covered right? It becomes covered in a steel cage or in a fireproof fireproof cage. And we're not able to actually feel the effects of bhakti. Even though it's our inherent nature to serve Krishna, we might not be able to actually get those effects. So it really behooves us to take a look at ourselves and look in our lives, where, where is that cage or that you know box um, stopping me from experiencing these effects? Because if it's stopping me from experiencing the effects, then the doubts will turn the wrong way. And the doubts will lead me towards not a good place. Mayavadi illusion, you know, making sense of, yeah, Krishna shouldn't be doing this with the gopis, you know. Whereas if where the heart is unfettered, then the doubts will lead us to Krishna. <laughs>
Prabhu said he could stay after class after Darshan. So you might want to mention that that he's here for questions after Darshan. Yes, we're we're gonna do five extra minutes, but we can't do too much more because I'm sorry, Prabhu, I have to go to work. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do. <laughs> Are you taking photos? We got a very quick darshan from Adi Purusha Prabhu. I appreciate it. A little bit is better than nothing. So here's our <laughs> extra time with Kishor Chandra Prabhu, everyone. So if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead. Okay, Prima well, Prabhu, I feel like you're the one that has the question. <laughs> Hari Bo, Kishor, Chandra. Wonderful, uh, wonderful class. Um, uh, not only uh, Shastrik, but of course, um, uh, very parsed out, uh, you know, for us neophytes to be able to grasp such an elevated topic. I was particularly um, uh, taken by the idea that the Bhakti Center has um, the uh, uh, um, visitor relation um, attitude of of meeting people where they're at and um i feel that all the best preaching i've ever seen whether it have been radnaf maharaj with myself or any successful preaching or any successful connecting with other souls new people as well as advances to always find out to always listen first where somebody's at <clears throat> and then you know uh, how much they understand. We have no idea where people are coming from as far as their past lives. Some people pick up uh, like yourself and, uh, uh, and, and Jai Jagannath Prabhu. It's like, you know, I can't wait till my next life when I can actually read the books and under and remember them mm -hmm. type of thing. So um, in that idea of Krishna, it, that the Bhakti Center uh, meets, uh, meets us where we're at um, I just wanted to make a comment that as a person who does not get being out in the country and only seeing the devotees and being with the devotees, as a lot of people who are very busy do only once a week or something like that, of course, every morning, this wonderful class, that we also come to understand that Krishna meets us where we're at um, all day long. Um, that, as you said, if we take a personal look at ourselves, if we have the time to spend uh, in introspection um, and then to assuage our doubt um, that the biggest doubt we have and the reason why that we hang on to the world, the material world and our sense gratification is that we doubt that Krishna is going to fill our cup, that if somehow if we don't empty our cup of Maya, of the material world, of, of saying yes, um, that somehow we don't think that Krishna is going to fill that ink 
that, that we pour out, that black, bitter ink of the Maya, that somehow Krishna won't fill it with nectar. Um, that reciprocation that you brought up at the beginning of the class, that Krishna personally reciprocates. And he not only reciprocates in the long run, but he reciprocates in the here and the now. Um, and that's where real shraddha, real faith is built. As you said, you prayed, how can I get this class? You know, this is such an elevated subject. Next thing you know, you were you were not only led to the right Shastra, but you were also given the uh, given uh, the association of the right Sadhu um, by Krishna's reciprocation. And that's truly, as you use this word, the in ineffable, the unspeakable, even though we can see we might. Oh, well, what a coincidence. Of course, there's no coincidences in Krishna consciousness. Um, I have noted that any time I have ever desired anything that was actually Krishna conscious, that Krishna immediately supplied. Mm. You know, if it was something to do with serving Krishna or the devotees, that Krishna made it, um, made it happen. And that's where Shraddha is built. And that we, we, that the quickest way to get rid of doubt is to at least have faith that Krishna will, um, Krishna will give us a cup of nectar if we just simply um, empty the cup of doubt. So thank you very much. for That was my takeaway on everything that you said there. And thank I, ho I hope I was somewhat near what you were trying to yes. express. Yes, thank Krishna. you. And I know Damodar Priya has to go. So I'll just say like one minute on what you said. I'll keep it short. This is a verse that we should all keep very close to our heart from Bhagavad Gita that uh, Krishna is going to reciprocate with us according to our degree of surrender. And um, it, is, it, is, it is ineffable, right? Because the, th that's why Sambandha and personal unique relationship with Krishna is so important. Krishna consciousness is not some rote, automated, you know, just do what everyone else is doing and everything's going to be fine. No, we act, if we want to go deep, we really have to develop that personal relationship with Krishna. However, that being said, Krishna reciprocates with everyone. And Krishna reciprocates, oh, you want to know me as Brahma Jyoti? Okay, here I am. I'm the Brahma Jyoti. You know, like Krishna reciprocates with everyone. And so whether you know it or not, Krishna is reciprocating with you. And I really, something I really appreciated yesterday was the first day of Julan Yatra and Mahatma Prabhu was there in temple and giving class. And he was mentioning this, this really beautiful, um, what's the word I'm looking for, tenet of bhakti, right? That we can engage our talents and our ourselves in Krishna service. And therefore, the reason I mentioned that because you made this comment of like, you know, oh, maybe in the next life I can read these books and et cetera. If someone has a philosophical propensity, great. Like Muhammad Prabhu is even mentioning this. If you have a philosophical propensity, great. There's so much Shastra that you can learn and read and memorize and debate and et cetera and whatever. And if your propensity is to paint, then you can do beautiful paintings of Krishna. And if your propensity is to dance, then you can dance for Krishna. And so everyone is actually engaged and has the opportunity to be engaged in Krishna's service. I do think, however, you know, we don't necessarily need to like, I don't think everyone needs to go and read all these like super Rasika, you know, kind of uh, literature Shastras. But I do think that it is important to know the history of our acharyas. I think that that's really important to know the struggles that they went through, to know the battles that they had to fight, to really, really solidify our lineage as legitimate. And it's something that I've always really um, appreciated. Um, Radhanath Maharaj loves speaking about this. He loves speaking about the acharyas and their histories. And he goes into all these stories about how, what happened in this and et cetera. And I think, last thing I'll say, sorry, Damodar Priya, I think it is important to know them just from a historical point of view, but also from a philosophical point of view, you know, that point that I made, why is all this stuff important? Swakya Ras, Padakya Ras, da, da, da. because basically, if we, if we don't know our history, we don't even know that people were basically, you know, these, these contenders were basically, um, antagonizing and what's that word i'm looking for like trying to delegitimize and calling into question our worship of radharani and that is like you know i just got chills like that's huge if someone calls into our into question our worship of Srimati radharani like you know absolutely not we need to we need to know 
why that was done, what the result of that was, et cetera. So can't, can't you just, can't you just knock them out? I mean, you, you could do that too, but I guess, um, yeah, I guess that's not a, you know, ahimsa is more of a yoga sutras kind of yama niyama thing. So yeah, you know, sometimes we need to, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I'm not, I'm not promoting violence folks. I'm not doing that. I am. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Kishore Chandra Prabhu. And thank you so much, uh, Bhima Prabhu. I, I definitely wrote down for myself, empty the cup of doubt so Krishna can fill it with nectar. Uh, unfortunately, it's too large of a title for the Srimad Bhagavatam class on YouTube, so I can't use the whole thing. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely appreciate that that sentiment. And thank you so much, uh, Kishore Chandra Prabhu, for giving us that little bit extra time so that we can get some additional questions and and kind of really nice reflections from everybody who shared. So I, I do apologize for having to go on to my material uh, responsibilities, but we, we, we're doing the best that we can. And like everybody said, Krishna meets you where you are, right? So Krishna is meeting me where I am as well in terms of my seva. That's, so the, that's the title for you. That's your title. <laughs> Kri Krishna meets us where we are. Yeah, I already put it, but thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Kishore Chandra. Thank you so much, everyone. And remember, Srimad Bhagavatam class is every day. So please join us. We're always happy to have you and to glorify the 